evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UC IMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or, as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our, in this instance, if not in any other, I mean myself and or who's, whom, whomsoever, who's ever, <laughs> I don't know how you say that, uh, what other, what other, whatever, whatever other, Wow, this is difficult. Whatever other views may leak into uh, my speech by way of the articles that I'm reading, because obviously people's views are um, expressed in their writing. And if I read an article, even if I don't agree with it or I do agree with it, those views are coming through anyway. And I don't vouch for those views. And uh, none of these other entities, WRFU, et cetera, blah, 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 vouch for my views. And basically everybody is pretty much throwing up their hands and going, oh, I didn't say that. Well, I did say that. So when I express a view like I'm doing right now, um, it is my own. If I'm reading a story I am hearing or uh, channeling, perhaps would be another way of saying it, uh, the views of the, the author of that story. And then if I comment on the story, then I'm back to my views again. So it's very complicated if you're not paying close attention. And even if you are, maybe it's, it's confusing. But be that as it may, views are flying left and right, coming from all different angles. The only thing that we can say for sure is that they are not the views of WRFU. They are not the views of UCIMC. They are not the views of the Urbana Socialist Forum or the views of UPTV or YouTube, for that matter, because these shows end up on YouTube as well. So get it? Got it? Good. Thank you. Anyway, uh, today is Monday, 7 p.m., thereabouts. A uh, very warmish day, a little cloudy at times, but not the rain that was predicted last week. No rain, just kind of cloudy and somewhat humid. Uh, but I suspect that uh, fall is on its way um, one way or the other, or something like that. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> what was I talking about? Oh, views. Well, I already talked about views, and I talked about the weather, so uh, we, we're done with that. Uh, immigration, that's what this show is about. It doesn't always, I'm not always talking about immigration. It's not like that's the only thing I ever talk about. But that's what the show is about. And, um, yeah. So lately, the big immigration story is, of course, DACA. And um, I have several stories about that. But I first, let me just do something else because... Uh, well, we talked about DACA last week. We talked about DACA the week before. Um, so I have another thing. Once again, you know, this is a, another let's uh, justify immigration based on the economic advantages of having immigrants in our country. That's uncomfortable for me. However, it is a legitimate but not reason. It's not a legitimate reason. It's a legitimate way to think about this issue because the problem lies in this, this sort of blanket rejection of immigrants as being somehow different, as being somehow uh, a drag, a, uh, an unwelcome change influence, change inducing influence. Um, there are all sorts of things said against immigrants. So while some of the, the notions about the negative notions about immigrants are hard to push back on because they're, they're subjective, like, Oh, well, immigrants are, are, um, they don't assimilate. Well, you can cite statistics of how they do assimilate or by generation or whatever, but that doesn't 
convince anybody who believes that because that's one of those things that you can where it's just like uh, you just look around you and go oh these people they're you know they still speak their own language and they're not uh, adopting our customs and look they dress differently and they they have different religions so they're not assimilating it, it's it's more one of those sort of emotional reactions and and a personal observation based around what you're looking at and how you uh, define what you see um, <clears throat> that's hard to push back on using statistics because you can say all sorts of things but if the person doesn't see it then they don't believe it uh, you know it's like ghost if, if, if you've never seen a ghost or you've never see, had a supernatural type experience uh, people can tell you their ghost stories all day long and you're like yeah well you know I've never seen one so yeah it doesn't exist for me <clears throat> so I think that a lot of the, um, the negative arguments that people make about immigrants are based around these kinds of personal I want to say prejudices but even if you want to be more um, forgiving <laughs> more accommodating than that I don't know if why you would want to be but if you did want to be um, you could call it something else but uh, whatever it is those things are not really amenable to uh, being changed by uh, reading statistics but the one thing that people are constantly talking about uh, when they talk down immigrants are the economic effects. Well, they use our social services, but they don't, uh, you know, they cost us money. They're very expensive. They take our jobs. You know, those kinds of statements, those you can say, no, that's not true. Here is, is an example. And, and it's a little harder to, for them to keep that argument going because uh, that's something that's measurable. It's, it's, uh, you, can, you can quantify it in some way. So, Having said all that, I will read this story and, and in the light of trying to make that kind of argument there. Um, something like that, yeah. Okay, anyway, this is from the Atlantic.com, entitled, The Rust Belt Needs Legal Immigration. President Trump supports a plan that would have the number of newcomers and cut off the Midwest's demographic lifeline. The Rust Belt states that tipped the 2016 presidential election to Donald Trump could be among the biggest losers from the proposed reductions in legal immigration that he has endorsed, according to a new study released Monday. The study from the nonpartisan Chicago Council on Global Affairs concludes that immigration has been a demographic lifeline that has helped several Midwestern cities partially reverse decades of population loss among native-born residents. For the cities of the Midwest, restricting current immigration levels is the last thing they need. An unnecessary tourniquet applied to a precious supply of new regional residents and workers, reads the report, written by nomographer Rob Peril, Peral a non-resident fellow at the council. Trump recently endorsed legislation from Republican Senators Tom Cotton of Arkansas and David Perdue of Georgia that would cut legal immigration in half. Some congressional Republicans are hoping to attach that bill to any legislation providing legal status for the undocumented young people known as Dreamers, who had been shielded from deportation by the Deferred Action Program Trump recently revoked. Democrats, however, would strongly resist any such attempt. Earlier studies by Paral have documented how much Midwestern cities of all sizes now rely on immigrants to offset the loss of native-born Americans in their prime working years. In the new study, he documents the critical role, critical, critical, critical role, trying to say that correctly, he documents the critical role immigration has played in driving the trajectory of overall population growth and decline in the largest Midwest cities since the turn of the 20th century. This latest research reinforces the political message of Parel's earlier work. It shows that a broad range of communities 
across the Midwest is relying on immigration to stabilize their populations and revive their economies. That could make it tougher for Republicans from the region to support the large reductions Cotton, Purdue, and Trump are seeking. There's no question that immigration is benefiting a lot of cities, including small cities. I don't think it's just big city Democratic mayors who support legal immigration. Immigration, as Paral demonstrates, was central to the rapid growth of cities from Akron and Grand Rapids to Detroit and Chicago through the first decades of the 20th century. Cities of the American Midwest were largely built by immigration, he writes. Immigrants and their children were a key component of the population growth these cities experienced. In 1920, foreign-born residents accounted for nearly one-third of the population in Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit. They also accounted for nearly one-fourth in Milwaukee and Minneapolis. Looking cumulatively at 13 large cities across the region, Peral calculated that immigrants accounted for about one-fourth of their entire population in 1920, with the children of immigrants contributing nearly another two-fifths of the total. But for decades, after the United States passed a restrictive immigration law in 1924, new arrivals were virtually shut out, and the foreign-born share of the population across the region rapidly declined. By 1950, immigrants provided only about one-sixth of the population in Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland, roughly half their level in 1920, and represented a, only about one in ten residents in Milwaukee and Minneapolis, less than half of their level 30 years earlier. Initially, the big Midwestern cities continued to grow despite the squeeze on immigration, as they attracted more whites from rural areas and a steady flow of African Americans heading north during the Great Migration. But after about 1950, those spigots also tightened, and the region's population spiraled into sustained decline. The latter half of the 20th century ushered in suburbanization, deindustrialization, and migration from the northeastern and midwestern states to southern and western parts of the country, Peral writes. The loss of immigration compounded the effects of these trends that sapped population from midwestern cities. The 13 large cities Peral tracked lost nearly 1 million residents combined from 1950 through 1970. Since then, the big Midwestern cities, buffeted by deindustrialization and other economic storms, have struggled to maintain their native born populations. Of the 13, all but Omaha suffered losses in their native born populations from 1970 through the five year stretch between 2011 and 2015, the most recent span covered by the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Almost without exception, those native-born losses have been substantial. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Milwaukee each lost about one-fifth of their native-born population over that period. Toledo, Akron, and Chicago each lost a little, little over one-fourth Cincinnati, just over one-third, and Detroit, Cleveland, and St. Louis, about half. But since the federal 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act reopened the pathway to mass immigration, many of these cities have once again increased their foreign-born populations. In no case has that been enough to completely offset the loss of native-born residents, but it's allowed many of the larger Midwestern cities to ameliorate the decline and fortify their population base. Since 1970, Peral reports, Chicago has added nearly 200,000 foreign-born residents. Minneapolis and St. Paul, just over 40,000. Kansas City, 25,000. And Milwaukee, about 20,000. From a low of 662,000 people in 1990, the foreign-born population across all 13 cities has recovered to 958,000. That's despite a slowdown of new arrivals over the past decade or so, as undocumented immigration has plummeted nationwide and more new legal immigration immigrants excuse me, have migrated towards southern and western states. 
Indeed, attracting immigrants has become a central economic development strategy for many Midwestern cities. Christina Pope, a senior regional manager for Welcoming America, a group that supports programs to help immigrants assimilate, said she now works with 60 local governments and nonprofits in a 10 state region across the Midwest and Mid Atlantic. The movement really is widespread, she told me. Just in the past year, we have almost about doubled mid membership in the Midwest. The areas with active programs to attract and assimilate immigrants range from large population centers such as Chicago, Minneapolis, and Columbus to mid sized cities like Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Akron, Toledo, and Dayton, to smaller places such as Battle Creek, Michigan, and Winona, Minnesota. Winona. Winona? Winona? I don't know. Many of them are holding events this week to celebrate links between immigrants and native born communities as part of the National Welcoming Week effort that is sponsoring hundreds of such gatherings. There really is a commitment on the local level from even these smaller municipalities, Pope said. Politically, the Midwest could be pivotal, could be a pivotal region in the approaching debate over legal immigration. Plans for reduction are likely to face substantial resistance from not only Democrats, but also from Republicans in the Northeast and West Coast states that have traditionally served as large-scale immigration, immigrant destinations. Conversely, restrictions could find substantial support from Republicans in Southern, Plains, and Mountain West states that have no tradition of large-scale immigration and only have small immigrant populations even today. As Perel writes, quote, voices against immigration have been raised by local residents of areas where few immigrants live and indeed where the general population may be in numeric decline, end quote. That alignment means the key to whether reductions in legal immigration gain any momentum in Congress may be whether Midwestern Republicans join the region's Democrats in resisting cuts or lock arms with most other Republicans from states between the coasts to support them. The complicating factor is that, just as on the drive to repeal the Affordable Care Act, any Midwest Republicans pushing to curb legal immigration could face considerable resistance from local GOP officials who see clear benefits in the existing policy. You can find exceptions to this, but there's a kind of tolerance in the Midwest that you don't see elsewhere, Perel told me. You can look at some of the southern states that passed draconian local ordinances against immigrants, but as a general pattern, you don't have those anti-immigrant policies here. So, it, like it, as the author says, it remains to be seen what's going to happen, but it's an interesting way to understand um, the history of immigration in this area where we live and and see what's actually going on and how that affects the the national uh, questions national questions about immigration and I might also add that as part of welcoming week which was mentioned here um, I should point out oh boy I should have had this prepared I don't I have to look it up um, that we, CU Immigration Forum, are having our Immigrant Welcome Awards this Saturday. That's the 23rd, I believe. Saturday the 23rd? I'm not sure. Um, what the date is. Yeah, this coming Saturday, 18... 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, yes, Saturday the 23rd. <laughs> and um, it will be held at the Muslim American Society Center which is at 2011 Brownfield Road in Urbana, from 2 to 4 p.m. on Saturday, September, what's this, 24th? What the heck? Let me see a calendar. No, 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 come on. Okay, today's the 18th. Yes, it'll be the 23rd. There's a mistake on this poster that I'm reading from, but be that as it may, uh, our part of Welcoming Week, our, not our part, we're doing a lot of things during Welcoming Week, but our big push uh, this year, as last year, is our annual Immigrant Welcome Awards, our fourth annual, I might add. 
So I will say once again that it's Saturday, September 23rd from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Muslim American Society Center, which is at 2011 Brownfield Road in Urbana. And I hope you can join us there. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And that will be our local um, <laughs> event, <laughs> I guess, our big local e event. Um, if I can put it that way. All uh, right. So, so that's the the Rust Belt, and uh, I, I thought I'd throw in our little my little plug for our welcoming awards this Saturday, the twenty third, at uh, Muslim American Center on Brownfield Road. Um, but yeah, so Midwest population decline in a lot of big cities, which is ameliorated by immigrants. Just pointing that out. Okay, uh, so moving on. Uh, how'd you like that? Uh, that was me just kind of rubbing my face and, and feeling the effects of life. <laughs> it's, it's rough sometimes. Um, so, what are people doing about DACA? Well, there are a lot of different things going on. There are people that are really concerned about it, as you might imagine. Um, and they're reacting in different ways all over the place. And, and here's one encouraging thing that's going on. This is from the ProvidenceJournal.com, entitled, uh, Rhode Island groups raised $170,000 to cover fees for DACA recipients. This is great news. I mean, we're doing some fundraising here locally and uh, around the state. I know there are various uh, groups that are raising money to help pay for this, but this is a lot of money here. So anyway, I'll just read it to you really quickly. It's very short. So it says, Governor Gina Raimondo said she and a number of philanthropic organizations have raised $170,000 to cover the renewal fee for all Rhode Island residents who are eligible to renew their deferred action for childhood arrival status, otherwise known as DACA. Oh, my headphones are falling out. Earlier this month, President Donald Trump rescinded protection for young adults who came to the United States as children but have now applied to legally work and attend college here. There are 1,200 so-called DREAMers in Rhode Island and approximately 250 are eligible to renew their DACA status, but they have to act quickly. Recipients whose work permits expire before March 5th must submit their renewal applications no later than October 3rd. They must be received by October 5th. This money is for those young adults. This is a human issue, Raimondo told a gathering of like-minded individuals. Trump's decision is plain, cruel, and inhuman. We have to make enough noise to make Congress do the right thing, starting with a permanent path to citizenship. Raimondo also reaffirmed the rights of dreamers. They are eligible for in-state college tuition, and they can receive two years of free tuition at the community college of Rhode Island. So that's one thing people are doing. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of legal uh, things going on right now where, um, well, I'll just, instead of telling you about them, I'll read to you about them. This is from Politico, and it's entitled DACA Recipients File Suit over Trump's move to end program. Oh, so this is one of the legal paths. It says a half dozen DACA recipients are suing President Donald Trump over his decision to end the program giving quasi-legal status and work permits to undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children. Several legal luminaries are backing the lawsuit filed Monday morning in federal court in San Francisco, including Harvard Law Professor Larry Tribe and University of California at Berkeley, Law School Dean Erwin Chermensky. 
One of the attorneys for the plaintiffs, Louis Cortez Romero from Kent, Washington, is less well-known but intimately familiar with the issue. He is a so-called dreamer. And one of the plaintiffs, DACA recipient Dulce Garcia, is also an attorney practicing in Chula Vista, California. The Trump administration is facing at least five suits challenging the decision to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program set up by President Barack Obama in 2012. A total of 15 states filed suit earlier this month in U.S. District Court in Brooklyn, arguing that the move to end the program is unconstitutional and violates federal law. Last week, four other states filed a similar case in San Francisco. The University of California also filed its own suit over Trump's attempt to phase out the program. Lawyers handling an existing suit in New York on behalf of DACA recipients have also signaled plans to update that suit to address Trump's new action, but the case filed Monday in San Francisco appears to be the first one actually filed on behalf of the so-called DREAMers. The decision to end DACA is not only inexplicable and immoral, it's unconstitutional, said Ted Botris, a Gibson Dunn attorney known for work on a key court challenge to California's ban on gay marriage. These young people were able to attend college, open businesses, and give back to their communities because they trusted the government to honor its promises and live up to its word. In suddenly and arbitrarily breaking those promises, the government is in direct violation of the Due Process Clause and federal law. Asked about the new lawsuit, Justice Department spokesman Devin O'Malley said the administration acted to bring legal clarity to a program that lacked authority from Congress. Quote, it was the previous administration's arbitrary circumvention of Congress that got us to this point. The Department of Justice looks forward to defending this administration's position and restoring respect for the rule of law, O'Malley said. While Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that the program is ending due to its legal flaws, Trump has expressed sympathy for their plight and has been negotiating a possible legislative deal to allow so-called DREAMers to get permanent legal status in the U.S. The legal team representing the six DACA recipients in the new case also includes University of California law professor Leah Littman and lawyers from the public interest law firm Public Counsel. Later in the day Monday, Trump's attempt to shut down DACA was hit with another suit. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, better known as the NAACP, filed its own legal action in Washington, D.C. Nearly all of the DACA registrants, more than 95 percent, are people of color, the complaint notes. So that's one thing that people are doing. Um, here's another thing that's interesting. It's uh, entitled, this is from CNN, and it's entitled, DACA Judge Reading Trump's Tweets Carefully. Hmm, what could that mean? Uh, it says, Trump administration lawyers find themselves once again grappling with tweets from President Donald Trump that at times undercut arguments his own Justice Department is making in court. Trump's tweets and extracurricular comments uh, have played a significant role in the travel ban litigation, and now his Twitter feed could complicate a critical deadline in his efforts to phase out the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. The latest example came Thursday, as a federal judge in New York heard arguments concerning the administration's planned termination of DACA, the Obama-era program meant to bring relief to undocumented immigrants who were brought to the United States illegally as children. Challengers rushed to court almost immediately after Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced this month the administration would be ending the program and the president rushed to his Twitter account. 